Hello everyone, my name is Christian, welcome to my hobby blog. Just to give a quick update, I am now 99% symptom free. I still have the occasional cough. Uh, my cold is basically gone, so I probably sound a lot better. But uh, today I wanted to begin the fourth review. Technically it's review 4, 5, and 6, because there are three films uh, in this release, in this box set. And this will be the whatever number review for the Vinegar Syndrome November 2022 subscription package. And this is a set that I'm not actually done with. Uh, I decided that because there's just so many notes to keep track of that I wanted to film these as I watched them and go through the special features. So there may be a bit of awkward kind of gaps or edits from one part to the other, but I would do my best to make it as smooth as possible. So first thing that I wanted to talk about is the first film that is in this set. And for those who haven't uh, watched the unboxing video or uh, really just the unboxing video, uh, I'm talking about today the Homegrown Horrors Volume 2 featuring the films of Hanging Heart Moonstalker and Dead Girls and so far Hanging Heart has been a very interesting uh, I guess exploration for me I'm trying to get this out apologies uh, I just opened Moonstalker so that's what the reverse cover looks like but yeah here's Hanging Heart so Hanging Heart is a movie that I really enjoyed um, it's, this entire box set, as I said before, is, uh, slasher focused. So you have a slasher on the loose. And this is how, this isn't really how he looks. Um, I don't even think this killer wears a mask. They just don't show his face. And he's actually has a hood on for most of the kills. But he comes up and strangles them with a brown stock, uh, stalking for uh and and in order i'm i apologize um in order to kill his victims and we don't know why he's or they are killing them and this movie uh my initial reaction was that this uh introduction of the film was amazing and even awesome because of the atmosphere and also the music. The music is very involved in this film and the music just kept kind of soothing me right back into the mood. I never really lost interest in this movie. It was entertaining from beginning to end. There was a lot of uh, really great lighting in this film and uh, one of the first kills uh, we have a strangulation that happens to a very important character that um, is dating our main protagonist. Uh, and he is broken up by it and he is blamed for it because he is there when it happens and finds the body because he fell asleep after having sex with his girlfriend. And so he goes to jail and is put on bail and his lawyer breaks him out. And after that, we kind of go back and forth of our cops thinking it's him and keeping an eye on him, but the murderers are, or the murders are continuing. And he's also having all these very erotic dreams with other men where they are all shirtless and pantsless and uh, covered in wax. And it's very, very sexually charged, uh, this entire movie. This is definitely an erotic thriller. Uh, one of the actors on the interview uh, references that multiple times. And I noted right away, as a fellow queer person, there's a whole lot of uh, homoeroticism in this film. And while I was watching it, I was like, oh man, it better not be, you know, a terrible representation of this because it started and immediately I was uh, concerned. Because especially in the year 1989, uh, the AIDS epidemic was uh, 
ravaging uh, gay populations and nothing was being done about it because people did not believe that it was a real disease. And if they did believe it was a real disease, they thought it was okay because it was taking out bad people. And it was a very dark and disgusting chapter of our lives that are, that are still having ramifications today. And I'm happy to say that this movie does not uh, feel toxic in its representation of queer people. And there's a whole lot of uh, sort of moments in this movie where I felt like they could have been pointing fun at the gay characters in this film, but they didn't. They presented these people as complex, as real people with real struggles and real issues and also hopes and dreams, and it just felt refreshing to me to finally watch a movie like this. And this is sort of why I wanted to film each of these in its own part, because there's a lot going on in this movie, and I just really enjoyed it. Uh, the mystery of the film, of who the killer is, in my opinion, doesn't even matter. Um, it is central to the story, but to me it's more about the relationship between our main character and the characters around him whether through his lawyer, who is very powerful on the law side, and then we have the cops, who are sort of against our main character, but also very powerful. And so we have this constant pushing and pulling of different uh, influences, and especially once he gets caught up in jail, he is roomed in with two other men, and they are having uh, gay sex in the cell with him in it, and he is absolutely terrified, and they don't even go near him they beat him up at some point because he's uh not being nice to them or they wanted to show that they're better than him and more powerful uh just any prison dynamics that go on when uh a new person goes in what i imagine uh when new people go into jail there's i'm sure somebody in there who needs to prove that uh the new person is beneath everybody and has to prove themselves and whatever that's what uh, a lot of prison films are about. Shawshank Redemption, uh, Escape from Alcatraz, um, oh, uh, Penitentiary, I think that's the best one. Uh, best prison film, in my opinion. Best boxing film. Uh, many things. But uh, this movie, I really enjoyed a lot. And uh, again, my first question was, were these... Uh, sort of queer elements uh how important was it to the director and the writer to put these in and how much did they think about it and just all of that just how did they uh sort of visualize how they would do this on camera because this was a very brave thing to do and the director actually talks about this on the special features and this is a perfect segue. I did not mean to do it, but uh, one of the interviews on this release is the interview with Jimmy Lee, who is the writer and director of this film. And it's about 23 minutes long. And he went to school for film, and he graduated undergrad the undergraduate program. And his professor of directing, or one of his classes after he did a 30-minute short film, he said, hey, you should write a full script and do a, uh, and then direct it. Uh, go the next step. And he felt very encouraged by this. And at the time, he had a friend who was gay. And so he actually worked with this friend to make a good, uh, complex, and great murder mystery. And... He said that uh, they really wanted to make a different type of slasher movie because he felt that there wasn't enough emotional resonance in slashers, which I fully agree with him. That's kind of the main thing that I want out of slashers is that emotional uh, layers to it, but that it's just not there. And for the most part, you're there for the kills. And like, that's it. Maybe the occasional... Uh, 
spooky atmosphere and something else aside from the kills but in this movie it really has it all the kills aren't even that graphic or even that effective i mean they're very intimate because they're being strangled but it's not going to be like uh i don't know fr uh, not friday 13th but nightmare on elm street where your villain is this you know big showman and who is doing just the most creative deaths like the killer in this movie, he just strangles you because he wants you dead. And there are reasons why he wants you dead. He's not a mindless, uh, not creature, but a mindless uh, killer like Jason, for example, from Friday the 13th, where he's just killing horny teenagers because he's on his, on, because they are on his land. And because he witnessed the murder of his mom and he was drowned and so on and so forth. Uh, we all know Friday 13th. If you're watching this, you probably know these slashes. So I don't need to explain too much. And he definitely achieved that. I was quite affected after watching this. I was like, wow. And especially the final shot of the film. Uh, we have a really great line where it says, why did you kill everyone uh, who was close to this person? And the killer says, because I loved him. And you can see he's... Uh, sort of messed up in the head because that's not how you uh, get somebody to love you by killing everyone that they are close with that is psychotic behavior nobody should be doing that but it definitely adds an unexpected aspect of the movie that I really enjoyed and one thing that uh, made me kind of look sideways and this is totally uh, moving on to a different subject is the matter of the budget because it's a very well made movie it looks very good and the director says that it was 1.2 million dollars budget which is a pretty sizable amount for an independent uh, project and he said that uh... oh no I apologize um, we also have the producer who uh, is interviewed for this release, and he said that the budget was 300000 which seems more realistic, but at the same time, with the resources they had, it looks like a $1.2 million movie, or even more expensive, because uh, the produce... Well, I'll get into that later, but it looks really fucking good. Uh, the cinematography is top-notch from beginning to end. Shots go on for more than two seconds, uh, for the most part, there's a really great shot that the uh, that the direct or the producer was talking about, where the at the end of the scene before they do that line that I said, uh, they are going through the jail cells and it's looking at the ground, looking at all the bars, and then goes up, looks at the wall, looks at the shadow of the killer, and then it goes and zooms in on the killer, all in one smooth uh, shot, and it's really impressive, like. All these people were uh, recent graduates and uh, were in the scene for just a few years or were not even involved in the film scene at the time in L.A. where they filmed and shot this film. And uh, it's just really impressive what they were able to do with this film. And he said that, or the director, Jimmy Lee, to go back to that special feature... He said that he saw a lot of comedies around this time from Europe that were dealing with gay characters where he felt, no, I don't really want to do another comedy. We need to do a serious film about uh, gay characters. And so he went the total opposite direction, he says. And he said that he uh, had gay characters in the story because he wanted to be different. He didn't want to do just another slasher. The slasher genre was becoming over uh, exposed at this point or over featured. It was being completely um, flooded. Uh, there's a reason why there's no good slashers in the 90s and even into the 2000s. It's probably worse in the 2000s. There's a few hits uh, throughout the 90s, which I can't think of right now because I haven't seen them in a while, but. Uh, he was definitely right in taking that direction because 
it may, having gay characters in this film who are actually people and not just caricatures feels so good. Um, it feels really nice to be able to watch a movie where they're treated like actual human beings. And at one point of the interview, the director says there's a shorter cut of the film that the distributors made that was 10 minutes shorter. And I have a feeling that the 10 minutes that were taken out were the dream sequences where our main character is being uh, kissed and having sex with uh, men in the film, such as his lawyer, such as uh, some of the cops that he sees. He's constantly... It feels like a angle of repressed homosexuality which the director didn't discuss at all but i have a feeling that was a uh, sort of what was intended for the audience um sort of this what repressing your sexuality is going to give you nightmares and is going to make you just kind of lose your mind and that you need to accept who you are and be happy because you are who you are and I appreciated that too um it's nice for a movie from the late 80s to say hey it's okay to be gay just you know just be happy that you are who you are I mean it's okay to be gay and I really like that um and I keep hammering over the head everybody uh, how great this is because this doesn't happen. Uh, I really enjoyed that aspect. And I have a feeling that the distributors were like, nope, and just wiped all that away. But thankfully, uh, Vinegar Syndrome uh, restored the full cut, which they didn't delete any of the uh, original prints of it. They were very uh, good about keeping them. And the movie looks great. The restoration looks really well done. Uh, not too many bad shots of the film, but, uh, next I wanted to talk about, um, the interview with Michael J. White, who is the producer of this film. He, uh, excuse me, this, uh, interview is about 12 minutes long. All of these interviews are pretty short. Um, I would have liked the documentary where they put them all together, sort of like how Vinegar Syndrome usually does, but... I think this is just fine. Uh, the, the producer says that uh, they met the director while they were both in the undergrad program. And after they graduated, uh, the producer was approached by the director, uh, Jimmy Lee, with a completed script called Hanging Hot. And he was able to... Uh, hire a sort of line editor or somebody who could polish scripts and so he did that and then while he was doing that the producer was uh getting everything together he was the production designer he was the audio person he was basically a jack of many trades throughout this film and again he uh stated that the budget was three hundred thousand dollars if that is the case, that is very impressive, very good work on everybody, because it looks very fucking good for a movie that low budget. Um, it is shot on 35 millimeter, millimeter, so it sounds like they really did not have to retake any of the shots. They didn't have to reshoot many of them. And one interesting bit that I really liked that I didn't even think about is that there's a building in L.A. that a lot of movie studios use for prisons. And this studio was used for the film Escape from Alcatraz, which is a Clint Eastwood film, which, is, which I remember being pretty awesome. Uh, it's been over a decade, so I'm not going to pretend as if I have any recollection of it, but I remember really enjoying that movie, and... I thought they actually filmed at Alcatraz because the set looked so good. And I didn't even, uh, it ain't, Alcatraz did not cross my mind while watching this movie. But thinking back to the sets in that movie, I can kind of see it. Um, so, lastly, uh, with the interview with the producer, he talked about how they were really looking forward to the home video market 
and after the original theatrical run because that was sort of the lucrative business for uh, slashers at the time in the 80s. And I think everybody knows that, especially with um, the Video Nasty era about how a lot of these tapes were being seized and people were arrested because they had certain films. And he said that when it came out, uh, there was a deal that happened where everybody got screwed over except for uh, whatever company put out the film. So they made all the money, but everyone else who, like the director, producer, the cast, and the crew, they made nothing because uh, there were a lot of really weird deals that were made. He would not go into deep detail about it, but he basically said... That it was just like many different kind of vague uh, figures that were given in the deal. But the last interview that I wanted to talk about, and it was the last one I, that I watched, was with the actor Dan Zukovich, who is uh, one of the cops in the film, I believe. And it's around 19 minutes long. And this one, he talks about how he was in a punk rock band. And a couple of them, actually, in the 1970s. And uh, even went to one of uh, the most famous shows by The Clash, which happened at uh, Piani Gardens uh, in 1979, which I'm not even a fan of The Clash. I haven't listened to them enough to even form an opinion on them. But even I know of that concert. It's a pretty huge one. and is pretty... Uh, well known as probably one of the most energetic, uh, fun concerts that's ever happened in uh, the genre. And after that, he transitioned to theater. And when he was hired on for the show, or for this TV, well, not TV show, for this uh, movie, he said that he basically just watched documentaries and read books about the LAPD in order to research his role, because he is one of the cops in the film. And he said that there were a lot of struggles in this movie, uh, getting it made, because of such the low budget. And he also said it was around uh, 300000 or something. I didn't write down exactly what number, but it was closer to the lower number than the higher number. And he said that... Uh, the director was just really passionate and very uh, easy to work with and says that he really enjoyed uh, the David Lynch aspects of this movie, which shockingly, I did not even think of David Lynch while watching this movie. It was so, I, I was so focused on the movie itself that I didn't really reflect upon sort of the, what other movies are like this. And this actor is a huge David Lynch fan, so that was a lot of fun to listen to him talk about all the different Lynchian elements, such as the dream sequences and the cinematography and uh, the characters especially. And he said around this time that he had seen uh, Blue Velvet, which is one of my favorite David Lynch films. And he said he saw that in theaters on 70 millimeter or something in a one-person uh, theater. It was just him in there nobody else was there and he said uh that he just kept thinking of blue velvet while making this movie and so he would try and kind of put his own uh lynchian elements into the film and i never even noticed that i was like what the fuck <laughs> like i love david lynch how did i not notice this and it was something that i was very kind of taken back by because it was just all these things are going on in this film that I was thinking about and reflecting upon. And it was just so much more out there that I didn't think of that I was uh, just not thinking about. So, yeah, that is all for Hanging Hot. I will see you soon with uh, Moonstalker. Okay, so we are back doing the Homegrown Horrors Volume 2. And we are now doing the next film, which is called Moonstalker. And this one is directed by Michael S. O. Rock. And this is one that uh, started out very strong, and then it devolved into your standard 
uh, camp slasher film, which most people in, or at least most people who collect Beninga Syndrome and who enjoy cult horror films like these, they will probably get a lot more mileage out of it than I will. I did not get much after the probably 30 minute mark. And we start off right off the bat with a bloody kill of a couple. And it is uh, supposed to be reminiscent of the Halloween intro. Uh, that's what the director was saying on the comment, or not commentary, but the documentary. And I didn't get that at all. Uh, it wasn't really first person shot or POV. And the killer is killing people with an axe and he walks to the rest of the campers that are having a campfire and they're singing uh, something. And uh, it pans up to the moon and the intro starts. It's a really good ending or beginning, I guess. And then we uh, cut to uh, a family who are now living in a or not living but the renting a camper van and they're in nevada i believe somewhere snowy and uh the main person in this family is the father he and his son are talking about fishing and the wife is uh nowhere to be seen and the daughter is inside in the camper doing whatever she's doing and uh a sketchy old man just kind of drives up and the father's like hey what are you doing you can't park here and immediately i was like this guy's the killer um because that's kind of the central theme connecting all of these is that it's a slasher it's a meta mystery we got to find out who the killer is and in this movie it isn't as easy to tell based off of just that guy because it's not him um because we ne the next scene we have is the sketchy old man parking his car after they come to an agreement and he parks it, opens his trunk, and there's an axe there. The axe that looks exactly like the one from the beginning of the film. So immediately I was like, okay, even more proof. And he gets invited to a campfire, so they go, or he goes... Uh, with the family and does a big old campfire they're doing marshmallows uh, they're having a great time and they're telling stories and he's talking about his son who is no longer around and this is my first tip off where I was like okay maybe the old man is not the uh, killer and the weird guy is just being very weird to everybody and I call him that not in a demeaning way, but he is weird to everybody. He's very uh, vague. Uh, he won't say exactly why he's there. He won't exactly say where his son went. He's very uh, close to the chest with everything in his life. So right off the bat, he's sketchy. And uh the family eventually are like okay th this guy is totally weird uh we're going to bed now and so they all part ways and the old man goes back to the trailer that he has brought and opens the door goes inside and there is his son in a straight jacket from a mental hospital with chains all around him binding him to the uh, interior of the trailer and he has a big old uh mask over his face where you can only see his eyes, and uh, he has some dialogue saying like, oh, aren't you so happy I rescued you from the hospital? Aren't you so happy that you're together again with me? Like, aren't I so amazing? And the next scene, he releases his son and gives him the axe and says, go. And that this is where I started to lose interest in the movie, because I didn't know where it was going. I thought this was going to be a fun uh, slasher movie where we actually cared about the victims because a uh, connecting tissue of the entire genre is that the victims are us usually deserve to die. They're usually dicks, assholes, uh, jerks, everything. And in this movie, we have this lovely family and 
in the first 15 minutes, they are all killed off screen. And then we hear about a winter camp going on. And then this is where it devolves into your normal Friday 13th like slasher movie, which is fine. Uh, for those who like that kind of uh, movies, you will probably enjoy this a lot more than I did. I know when this box set was uh, announced, when, or at least one of the titles, which was Moonstalker, that was the only one for the longest time that they an had announced from the set. Uh, a lot of people were very excited, and I think the big strength of this movie is the setting. It is during the winter, they filmed in Sub-Zero... Uh, conditions in Nevada during the middle of the winter and there were some uh, pretty interesting stories uh, behind the scenes where they just were on the verge of uh, quitting the jobs because it was just so cold and nobody could work. Uh, they didn't have any running water. It was really bad but uh, I really enjoyed the environment of it. It really gave it something new uh, if this was just another summer slasher movie, I probably would have turned it off. I would have been like, okay, I know exactly what's going to happen. I'm done. And the kills in this are a lot better than I thought it would be. There are dismemberments. There are limbs flying. There are decapitations. There's a really cool uh, kind of setup towards the end where we have everybody on a swing and uh, it's supposed to be them singing, uh, she'll be coming around the mountain when she comes. And it's actually on a boom box, and it's like all of the victims stitched together. And s somebody who has just been hung uh, on a noose, uh, the body is bobbing up and down, and it's moving the swing left and right. It's a pretty fascinating setup. But that's probably the most interesting part of the film. Uh, and I just did not care <laughs> uh, beyond the point where the family was killed. Because I was, I was just so disappointed. Because I had expectations that this was going to be like a refreshing, unique uh, slasher film. Especially in the winter. But the winter part is really the only unique part of it. The killer looks pretty good. Uh, he has the chains around him constantly. He uh, has an axe, which just is basically like Memorial Valley Massacre, which was a summer slasher movie that I think I may have talked about it during Spooktober, but I definitely watched it during Spooktober, and I really enjoyed that one. Uh, it was really fun. But uh, there's only really one special feature to note here on this release which is the um, Campus Stampa Lives, uh, Resurrecting Moonstalker, which is a 96-minute documentary. And this uh, documentary is a new one that was produced by Vinegar Syndrome. Uh, it's really well put together. I did not watch it all because I just honestly did not care enough. Uh, originally, this movie was called Campus Stampa, which the director really, really wanted because he just thought it was a better name, but the studio was like, no, you can't do that. It's untranslatable. And he thought that was BS, but he relented and let them uh, change it. Uh, <clears throat> another interesting part is that the director came from Tales from the Dark Side, the TV show, which was... Uh, a pretty highly acclaimed TV show from the 80s, I believe. Kind of along the same lines as the uh, Tales from the Crypt TV show that kind of started it all. Well, I guess Creep Show started it all and then uh, Tales from the Crypt. But uh, this movie was part of a two picture deal that was another director's work um, <clears throat> That did not really go through well, but uh, but the documentary goes through and talks how the actors were found, uh, and it interviews the actors about the thoughts on the production, and they tell many many stories. And I watched about thirty minutes of them recounting pranks they were doing, uh, how they were doing shots, 
and all this stuff, and I just, I could not go on. I did not care about the second half of the film. I guess the second, or the last 75% of the film, I did not care about. So I just stopped watching it. Um, I apologize, but at the same time, I am here to give my honest reaction. So I do apologize for those who wanted more, but that's how I feel about it. So the next one that I just finished, and I'll just go ahead and say the really disappointing thing about this set is that it started off so, so well, and each movie, it just got much worse from movie to movie. The first movie, uh, Hanging Hot, was, just blew me away, as you probably just heard. I am recording these as the hours go by, but, um, Moonstalker, I did not like as much. Um, I think I will probably rate it a three on my letterboxed. I think it was just average. It's probably a lot better for those who are into the genre than, uh, than I am. But this movie, um, this next one, was one that I just really, really did not like. I borderline hated it. And the movie that we are now talking about is the one from 1990, directed by Dennis Devine, Dead Girls which just has so, so much potential. It is absolutely disappointing. Um, if you don't know what the story is of the movie, I talked about it in the Vinegar Syndrome unboxing video, but it starts right off the bat with a title card saying that the audio, soundtrack, and basically every everything has been compromised on the actual negative. So it... Uh, would not be the best presentation. And the audio levels were definitely off throughout the movie. But we start off with a uh, blood sacrifice of a couple teenagers hanging out, listening to some heavy metal by the band Dead Girls, which the movie is called after. And they uh, all kill themselves uh, successfully, except for one of them, who is the sister of one of the band members. And uh, while the metal group is uh, interviewed during the press tour, uh, they receive a troubling letter that is accompanied by a ghost encounter, basically saying, hey, your sister has been uh, like put into at-home care because of a suicide attempt. And uh, this band member goes home and... Uh, they get into constant fights with the parents and the aunts and the preacher, everybody, ever. Uh, everybody just fucking argues and belittles each other. And it, <coughs> excuse me, it makes me wonder why the fuck they are even in a band with each other. It is absolutely maddening watching these characters because the rest of the movie is them basically like Evil Dead going, we need a do something, uh, we need to get away, let's go to a cabin in the woods, and so they do, and the entire movie is them slowly being killed off, and it's just like, everybody just hates each other, all they do is cuss at each other, they are constantly belittling each other, and... We get a, even the kills are so, so bad. They're off, ca they're off camera, which is fine, because the budget for this movie is $75,000, which the documentary talks about on this release. Uh, during one of the scenes early on, when they're in the bedroom with the uh, younger sister who has uh, attempted suicide, there is a very sick... Uh, Iron Maiden poster of one of my favorite albums by them, Seventh Son of a Seventh Son. And we also have probably one of the what I don't want to say the West because it is limited by the budget, but it is a costume design of the killer that I do not like at all. And by the end of the movie, uh, we get many ki lame kills where it is shown off camera. 
and we only see the effects of it, which is usually just a splash of red paint on somebody's face. And it is absolutely annoying to me. Uh, there's nothing more that I hate in slasher films than off-screen kills. Moonstalker at least had kills on screen. They were great kills, but not much else in that movie. The thing that drives me crazy, though, of this movie is that everybody is basically the killer. Uh, and that's not a spoiler, because everybody hates each other. Everybody is out for themselves. And it is so maddening to me, because the entire movie, they're just talking shit to each other, calling the woman fat, and calling the men uh, limp dicks, and just being awful to everybody. And the entire movie is them just slowly killing each other off. And then, uh... So we get, like, the first killer reveal, and it's like, oh, okay, that makes sense. It makes sense that this person's the killer. Okay, cool. Oh, wait, we still have, like, 15 to 20 minutes left. What is going on? Oh, now we got another reveal. Oh, we got another reveal. Oh, we got, like, four reveals back to back to back to back of killers. And... Apparently, they are all using the same costume. I don't know how. Because the entire movie, every kill that we see, and we see every single kill, is done with the costume. I don't know who the killer was. Well, I know who the killer was, but I don't know how they were able to access the costume. And how they all were. Unless they were all working together, but... Every monologue that we have at the end of the movie is the killers going, I hated them, I'm so happy they killed each other off, I'm happy they killed each other off, and going back and forth. And the little sister, she was supposed to go up with them, but she had a nervous breakdown and left with her caretaker. And the caretaker shows up at the end of the movie with the sister and is like, let me get your medallion that fell uh, into the barn because the barn is uh, a place of like spiritual uh, wonkiness or something that the sister says. And the caretaker walks in and just sees like every corpse of the, in the movie just laying there. And our main final girl is bound and gagged in there. And the caretaker is like, you know what? Instead of doing my job and, uh, you know, calling for help, calling the police, figuring the shit out. I'm just gonna leave you here. Uh, this is the best that your sister deserves. And it is... I hated it. I absolutely hated what she was doing. I did not like at all that ending with the caretaker. I thought it was absolutely disgusting. Uh, because the entire movie you're seeing these characters slowly be killed off whatever they all suck but the final girl was actually a good character and the caretaker is supposed to also be a good character she shows up and she just goes fuck you i'm just gonna let you die and it just drove me the fuck crazy like who the like oh my god and i don't know i don't know um i hated this movie <laughs> i just really did not like it um i think the directors were going for the right thing. I thought it was a really great idea, but it just was not executed right. I think if the caretaker was like, okay, let's go, because it does end very similar to Friday 13th Part 3, where they do end in a barn with, with the straw all around, the pitchforks, you know, all the farm tools, and it is so frustrating to me. I just cannot believe that that was the ending. And when I went on Letterboxd, I was not the only one. So I feel pretty uh, validated about that. Because I thought I would be the only one. I thought I would be a negative Nancy about this. But it's not just me. So it is such a shame that as this box set was explored by me, the less fun it became. Uh, Hanging Heart was just such a well-made awesome, well-written, great kills, everything. And we get to Moonstalker, and it's great kills, but not much else. 
and then the final one is no great kills, no great care. It's like just going down, like the nine circles of hell. It feels like, and it was not fun um, watching this movie. But I did watch about half of the documentary because again, Benega Syndrome does really great work doing these big, long, epic document not epic, but documentaries where they explore. Uh, everything about the movie, talking to uh, the composer, the director, writers, producers, uh, many actresses and actors involved, and so on and so forth. And so I guess I'll talk about that documentary now from Dead Girls. Uh, right off the bat, they said that they were influenced by Italian Giallo. I totally uh, saw that. Um, the they said that Dario Argento's uh, Bird with the Crystal Plumage, Bay of Blood by Maria Bava, and Torso were sort of the main ones, but that the killer was modeled after the killer in Blood and Black Lace, which is another really great Maria Bava film, which I've seen. Uh, the cast talked about how they got involved. Uh, one of them was a model builder for sci-fi films, which was really interesting. Uh, one was an actual model uh, who decided to be in movies after that. And the creators of the film, it's a trio, uh, they came up with the idea of the story from the news story where Ozzy Osbourne was uh, sued because uh, a teenager had killed themselves and listed that song by Ozzy Osbourne that discusses suicide as an inspiration to commit this act. And they said that they were like, well, instead of using the word sued, what if we said killing? And I thought that was a really interesting idea, but I just don't feel as if it was executed well at all. It, it seemed a little tasteless with how they were quick to kind of exploit the story based on a teen's suicide, but... Uh, that's neither here nor there, but uh, the director was talking about how he wrote the screenplay by himself and that uh, he had written the script and never looked at the page count and it ended up being like 150 pages, which is really scary when you think about it because screenwriting rules basically say that Every page of screenplay is basically a minute of screen time is kind of the accepted rule of screenwriting, which is, I'm not sure if that's still accurate today, but that was something I learned in uh, one of my film courses somewhere. But uh, he said that he finally got it down to 120 pages instead of 150, and I still think that's too long. Uh, I'm not sure what could be cut out because this movie's an hour and 45 minutes. It feels really long, so it's really annoying. But uh, one thing that made sense a lot was the budget. Uh, it was not as big as the two other films, or at least definitely not as big as the Hanging Hot one with the 300000 minimum to up to a million dollars. But... This movie was made for $75,000, uh, made very uh, low-key. They were using their own equipment. They were using their own houses, which, really cool. Um, I assume that Iron Maiden poster has to have been uh, the director's. I hope it was, because I love Iron Maiden, and that was probably the highlight of the movie. But, oh my gosh. Um, for the rest of the documentary that I watched, it was just... Uh, the actors talking about the time with it and saying how it was pretty mediocre. Uh, some of them said it was really fun. And all of them said that they did not like horror movies, but that, you know, they were there for a paycheck because it's a job. And so they were just um, doing what they needed to do to get the bills paid. And so, yeah, that. I kind of gave up around there because I was like, I'm done with this box set. I, I am done. Uh, Hanging Hot was a full uh, discovery for me. Uh, I'll keep the box set for that. But the other two movies wasn't for me. 
uh, the not bad films. Uh, it's just that they're not for me. Uh, I think people who are fans of slashers will really enjoy Moonstalker the most. I really enjoyed Hanging Hot the most. And I think a lot of people who are very forgiving of slashers, not like me, <laughs> will enjoy Dead Girls somewhat. Um, so yeah, I apologize for the negativity, but Dead Girls just really sapped my patience today. Uh, especially because it wasn't an hour and a half. Hanging Hot, uh, I'm looking at now, is almost the same length as Dead Girls. And Hanging Hot is just like, just going constantly. And Dead Girls, it's like them hanging out on the beach for 10 minutes. And then we have a two minute uh, kill scene. Of which a minute and a half, well a minute and 50 seconds of it is the killer chasing after them. And they're going, ah, ah, screaming through the forest. By the way, they film in a forest, which is one thing that I hate about low-budget movies because it's free to film in national parks or just forests in general because it's rare that somebody will find you. And so you can film your shitty Bigfoot movie if you want. That's why I love Suburban Sasquatch because it stays... Uh, and keeps the setting changing throughout. But uh, Dead Girls, it just looks the same every single kill. And they don't even show the kill. So it's, it's really disappointing. Uh, Dead Girls was the one I thought I was going to like the most because it had the heavy or the death metal kind of angle to it. And they only have one song that they play from beginning to end of the movie, but they play it over and over again. And it's fine. It, it sounds like a garage band, <clears throat> which they talk about on the commentary tra on the documentary. I did not listen to the commentary track, but they talk about how uh, when they were doing the songs for the movie, which some of the score in this movie does sound really good. There was a part where I was dozing off because I was just done with the movie and a really awesome beat came in. I was just like, oh, oh OK, I'm back in. <laughs> but uh that particular song by the band was just like two minutes and it was, you know, a pretty heavy riff and the main girl singing in the background and it sounded like a garage band and it sounded great, but it was just one song. I mean, I don't know. I should probably stop because I could keep going, but I don't want to be negative. Uh, thank you all so much for watching. Oh, wait, hold on. Who? Would I have bought this without the subscription? Probably. I bought Volume 1 without the subscription and enjoyed it fair enough. Uh, I think I'll keep this for Hanging Hot, as I've said. Uh, that's my favorite one. Moonstalker, I think I'll revisit next winter, maybe. I don't know. Um, Dead Girls, never again. I That ending, so frustrating, but... I wish someone would do, like, a nice, nice release of Hanging Hot. <laughs> Just Hanging Hot. That way I could uh, kind of earn back my money on the uh, selling the Homegrown Horrors Volume 2. Sorry. Have a great rest of the weekend.